this week on the back table podcast. Um, you know, really kind of getting that broad exposure during your training is important. Uh, I'm glad to hear, you know, programs like Kumar's, you know, are exposing the fellows to all the different modalities, you know, that, that are really out there so that ultimately when they go off to the, you know, practice that they're going to be in, they, they will have had good technical training and hopefully complementing with that, of course, good uh, background knowledge and scientific understanding of, of this important procedure. Cause this is really one of the, probably one of the most gratifying procedures we can do in interventional radiology. And right. especially those grand slam kind of cases, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the ones that walk out, you know, of their outpatient procedure feeling like a million bucks. I mean, that's, that's really one of the best feelings you can have. So I think it's, it's a very important skill set uh, in the, in the armamentarium for an IR. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your resource to connect with your IR colleagues and learn tips, techniques, and the ins and outs of the devices in your cabinets. This is Aaron Fritz. I'll be filling in as your host this week, and I'd like to remind you that you can find our whole catalog of podcasts on the Back Table app found in the Apple Store. I'm here with Dr. Vinu Vadlamudi and Dr. Kumar Malaseri to talk about treatment of compression fractures in the spine. Great to have you back, fellas. Uh, for any new listeners, I'd like yeah. you to just briefly introduce yourselves, uh, where you're located, and kind of how vertebroplasty or or kyphoplasty became a part of your IR practice. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, as, as Aaron uh, mentioned, uh, it's certainly great to be back uh, on the podcast. I think this is an excellent resource, and, and really kudos to, to Aaron and Mike uh, for kind of spearheading and pushing this forward as another resource, especially for, I think, younger IRs. Uh, it's a, a really nice resource. Um, as Aaron mentioned, my name is Venu Vadlamudi. Uh, I'm a body IR and neuro IR trained, um, and I'm in practice, private practice in Alexander, Virginia. Uh, and just sort of briefly about, uh, you know, vertebral compression fractures and that aspect of our practice. Um, you know, my senior partners, well before I joined the practice, had been treating vertebral compression fractures um, and have gone through probably most of the different iterations of the tools that are out there, kyphoplasty, vertebroplasty, uh, vertebral augmentation, you know, with osteotomes and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, at this point, uh, we predominantly do either straight vertebroplasty or um, in some cases, vertebral augmentation with vertebroplasty. And then um, somewhat separate, but certainly related is um, spine tumor ablation and vertebroplasty following that. So just sort of a brief overview of the kind of practice that we have. Um, and like I said, we've been incorporating that in our practice for um, well over probably about 15 years now. Um, and so I think that really offers um, a great service, especially in terms of palliative pain control for patients. And so, um, you know, we find good referrals based on our kind of long track record. Pretty exactly what I would say there. That's pretty good there, Reno. This is Kumar Madisari, uh, one of the interventional radiologists at Rush University Medical Center in warm Chicago. Um, our practice is a, uh, well, first off, actually, Aaron, Mike, you do a fantastic job with this uh, podcast is something great that we never had earlier on that I think is of immense benefit, as Vayner said, to everybody out there, especially the young guys. So uh, kudos to you guys. Thanks, Kumar. Um, in our Appreciate practice, you know, no, yeah. Um, in our practice, we use kyphoplasty, vertebroplasty, uh, actually augmentation, um, kind of in a mixed bag as to operator preference. And also just because we're, we have a fellowship and training center, we like to have all the options so everybody learns what they see are the differences, what we think are best. We can kind of develop our own kind of understanding of what we think benefits patients. Um, also, we do the spine tumor ablations as well, along with hypoplasty or vertebroplasty, depending on the patient. Um, our mixed referral system gives us about, I'd say, 50% outpatient, 50% inpatient. Just depends on you know the time of the year, I guess. But um, you know, I, I think we can get into what we think about it as we go. But that's kind of how our setup is. Yeah, I mean, I, that's kind of leads into the next question I had, which is kind of how patients present predominantly in your practice. Um, uh, in my former practice, it was mostly through the ER. And so I'm really curious to know how you build those outpatient referrals. Uh, so if you guys have any pearls or pitfalls on kind of building that outpatient referral pattern. Yeah. So thanks. Um, at our place, you know, we've developed over the years, a good pattern of being able to have uh, outpatients sent to our clinic directly um, basically, every day we have a clinic, outpatient clinic that's run by MAs and one of us, and as well as mid level. So, everybody has been made aware over the last couple of years, especially our orthopedic surgery, spine surgeons, as well as um, neurosurgeons uh, and 
family medicine and internal medicine teams, we've talked to all of them as well as the ER itself. So they're able to just basically put an outpatient order immediately when they see the patient. We see that right away protocol. We get to call the patient and maybe the same day just have them walk over. That's made life a lot easier for a lot of our referring physicians and more importantly, the patients themselves so they can get piped into the system immediately. So once we started promoting that and telling them how easy it is, made it easy through our Epic system, it's almost instantaneous for us. Yeah. That really helped us out over the last couple of years. And then the second one is, at our place, we have a, a service line called the Fracture Liaison Service. And it's actually headed by a endocrinologist uh, physician who's in his older ages, but he's an expert on fractures and fracture medical management. So he's a person that automatically gets counseled by the system anytime a patient comes with a pelvic or vertebral fracture. So a while back I met with him, we kind of realized that there's a lot to kind of work together on. So he and his team gets called on any any fracture, and then, you know, he's an expert on the medical management, which we probably aren't the, you know, the biggest experts on, but we can work together. Similarly, when I see a patient in clinic, I send them as a follow-up to his clinic as well, so he makes sure they're optimized from a bone health standpoint. Uh-huh. Having these multiple kind of avenues have really helped us out, uh, build that up slowly over time. Yeah, that sounds like a great partnership to have. Um, how is it on your side, Binu? Uh, yeah, we kind of get, you know, uh, a mix. I would say our outpatient versus inpatient mix is maybe about 30 to 70 or 40 to 60. So skewed certainly towards the inpatient side. Uh, but one of the things we've been actively working on over the last uh, probably at least year and a half to two years is um, working more directly with not just the primary care physicians, uh, especially those who deal with a more geriatric population, uh, but also with the uh, emergency room, um, giving them uh, education and talks to say, well, if these patients present um, to the emergency department, you know, in, in a lot of the cases, they may be on, let's say, blood thinners. You know, a lot of these older patients may be on Coumadin or other blood thinners. So we're not going to be immediately able to treat them anyway. Uh, you know, we might have to wait for the blood thinner to wear off and whatnot. So we work with them to say, okay, well, let's try to get some acute pain control. We get them uh, seen in consultation, get them an appointment made, you know, to come back as an outpatient, uh, you know, to get the procedure done uh, unless something, you know, dramatically improves with their pain. Um, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I think also doing outreach with, you know, primary care offices is, um, you know, part of the way we get some of those outpatient referrals. Uh, again, you know, they, they will come to our clinic and, you know, see us for a formal consultation. You know, we go over there, um, not just the, the fracture and the pathology behind that, but really what are their particular risk factors. Uh, and one of the things that we do in our practice is um, essentially all of our patients get a, a referral to um, a physical therapy programs that are around here, kind of really specifically targeting uh, osteoporotic mm-hmm. patients. So we know that that is one of the ways that we can try to help them in addition to the medical management and usually from the medical management side of things, we do, um, I think, some of the management, but um, like like Kumar, and, and it's great to hear in his setup that they have a really a dedicated endocrinologist uh, focusing on this group of patients because it's a lot of patients and they do need oftentimes some very specific help. Um, so we'll usually work, again, either with the primary care doctor or sometimes refer them to endocrinology uh, if they do need more specific medical management. Yeah, so like along the the lines of reaching out to outpatient primary care docs, one challenge that I've seen is that the outpatient docs and primary care, especially, aren't as familiar with the broad scope of I, the IR practice. You know what we're capable of, and they they might think of kyphoplasty or vertebral plasty as a case for like a spine surgeon or pain management doc. Do you have any suggestions on how to overcome that hurdle? Uh, do you have any sort of like, do you send out marketers or are you actually going yourself into these offices to talk to the docs? Kind of a bit of both. Um, so, so in our practice, we do have um, a couple of folks who specifically do marketing for our practice as a whole, and that includes the, the IR you know, side of things. Um, so we'll have them make office visits. Um, honestly, we, we try to utilize you know, some of the, the vendors themselves because they often in those companies will have specific people focused on education. You know, that's their sole job. And so we want to try to employ them really, again, to get the awareness and education out there. Um, but you're right. You know, I think the broad scope of things that IR does often, you know, maybe beyond what uh, the primary care you know, physician may be thinking about. Uh, so I think that's where us going particularly to these offices and, and you know, just talking with them, sitting down. Uh, in fact, just, just uh, like 
five minutes before this um, um, podcast, I was emailing with one of my partners uh, because we're going to go meet with the hospitalist, for example, at one of the hospitals. And again, here's sort of a, a, a brief but pr- pr- somewhat comprehensive list of services that IR performs. And of you know, among that is, of course, spine services relating to compression fractures and then other things, you know, pain injections, which can certainly relate um, with these with these same subgroup of patients. So I think that is important for them to to realize that IR uh, does see these patients, can manage them. It doesn't always mean that it's a vertebroplasty is, you know, as far as the right procedure or something that might help them. Maybe something else is a better option. Um, and I think just, again, kind of reinforcing that this is a true clinical service that, you know, we're going to see and help these patients and manage them clinically. And it's not simply going to get dumped back on them when, you know, oh, we don't know what to do now. Okay, you deal with it. You know, we'll try to make sure to take care and follow through, you know, where we need to. Uh, another one of our referral, you know, sources, I think similar like Kumar's is, um, is actually spine surgery. You know, um, one of the orthopedic spine guys in our area, uh, he, you know, he has a busy enough practice that, that frankly, he kind of can't even sort of take on this volume. And so, you know, that's been a really good relationship to have where, you know, he, he recognizes we offer a good service, we help these patients. And so he will often either redirect these patients to us, or if they happen upon his clinic, he'll say, okay, I'm going to send you over to these guys. They'll take it from there. So that's another, you know, kind of way to, to show that, you know, we can offer a good service. And again, kind of that uh, good, clear communication about all the different types of things that we can do in IR is important. Yeah. And, and another question on the inpatient side, um, for, are your diagnostic colleagues assisting with identifying these patients? So when they come in with the MR yeah, or the CT, yeah, go ahead, Kumar. That's exactly what I was going to kind of point out. I agree with everything Maino was saying about the outpatient side, but on the, the imaging side, our colleagues can be a great resource to say, you know, especially our, for us, our neuroradiologists catch, you know, most of these MRI fractures or find them or, you know, diagnose them. And you say, okay, who are these people? And you kind of look it up and you talk to the physician and say, hey, we know this is a fracture. How's this patient doing? And it's part of our, our, our global need to increase awareness of what we do. But then you reach out yourself and you talk to them and say, hey, you know, how, how is this patient doing? I'd be glad to see this patient. And you got to make them comfortable and understand that you're not just out there treating every patient, but you'd like to see the patient evaluate. And some patients may not be good for it, but at least you get your name in their face and that you're available right away and you can do it. I think you take ownership, but like Manu said. So the inpatient colleagues, everything I started, the imaging colleagues are a great resource because they're the first ones seeing them. So you start developing a system. We do that for PAD as well sometimes. You you have them kind of give you a heads up, or you look at it, and then you reach out, and I think that's a great way to start building your relationships. Yeah, I agree agree with Kumar. You know, I mean, we 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 have to, you know, in the same sort of vein of educating primary care doctors, ER doctors, you know, as far as what what we can do in IR. A lot of times, we actually have to, you know, have continual education even for our diagnostic colleagues because you know IR does so many different things. I can tell you, you know, even within our own practice, like. Sometimes they may not even be totally aware of all the things that we can do or that we're sometimes, you know, if it's something we're willing to try, you know, and I think that's an important, you know, education piece internally. Uh, and again, trying to get them to, you know, not just do their part of things, which is recognizing it from an imaging standpoint, but hopefully giving us um, a notification. And, and, and I would say in our practice, a lot of the times they do give us sort of that heads up that, hey, there's a compression fracture um, and, and then from there, you know, similar to kind of Kumar's approach, uh, we sort of, you know, we'll, we'll kind of proactively reach out and talk with, you know, whoever the referring doctor was, whether it's outpatient or inpatient, and find out more about the patient and see perhaps there's something we can help with, you know, if, if, uh, if the patient's pain is not under good control. Great. Um, yeah, so I wanted to get into a little bit about technique, because uh, I know, Vinu, you, you actually perform more vertebroplasty than kyphoplasty. And I was just curious to know how that came about. I, I just trained doing kyphoplasty. I don't think I've never actually done a vertebroplasty. And so I'm curious to know um, how you started just, just leaving out the balloon. Sure. Um, so, so part of it, yeah, during my training, I, you know, I did train on both. Um, but, you know, a little bit, I would have to say is sort of from kind of, you know, looking at the literature, looking what's out there, um, you know, I think in some of the meta-analyses that are out there, there may be a slight advantage of kyphoplasty over vertebroplasty. Uh, but I think all in all, I would say, at least my opinion is that the data is mostly a wash, um, that, you know, uh, 
obviously some sort of vertebral augmentation, if we kind of lump them in that more broad kind of category, um, seems to work, of course, in the right patient with the pain and the fracture, um, putting it all together. We know we can help these patients. Um, and so almost in a sense of sort of simplicity, I think really, um, you know, our, our practice, we, we meet quite often, we kind of sit down and say, well, as a section, what do we want to do? You know, how do we want to make you know services available, et cetera? And so, you know, we kind of looked through and looked at data that's available and say, well, maybe we should just sort of almost simplify things and go with just this straight vertebroplasty. Um, and that's part of even what I talk about in consultation with patients. You know, I talk about the fact that there's there's these different flavors of of ultimately getting cement into the bone, um, and you know how much cement you get in there. Uh, you know, height restoration, I think, is something that sounds great in, in theory, um, but, you know, there's not been any hard data that shows that it actually makes a difference in, in you know, specific outcomes. Um, and so there's lots of different devices and tools and techniques and including things that are not even available in the U.S. Uh, but I don't know that there's enough hard data to say that any of them are truly superior to vertebroplasty alone. So that's kind of the sort of scientific rationale that we use behind that. Um, this, uh, past fall when I was at, uh, uh, WFITN in Budapest, um, uh, Mary Jensen, who's a neurointerventionist from, um, UVA and their group was the first to describe back in 97, um, for tuberoplastic for compression fracture. Um, you know, she did a really nice comprehensive review of the literature and the devices and things that are out there. And I remember that was really one of her particular conclusions was that, you know, looking at all the data, all the different devices, there's not really a clear cut benefit of any kind of additional manipulation over plain cement alone. So that, again, for me, at least personally, kind of helped solidify that approach. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, I'm, you know, certainly curious to hear, you know, Kumar's approach to things, because I, I think in his setting, I think it's actually important, though, that as you know, trainees certainly have that ability and exposure to learn about all the different tools. Yeah, you know, I, that's, it, I think you make some very excellent points about what the individual op uh, operator chooses when they kind of go out to their own place, and that's kind of how you should be operating, because you're using it based on evidence, and I think that's how we should be training. At our place, you know, we, we have three different systems. Primarily, we end up using two, whether it's kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty, but we do have three because, you know, one is a kypho with a RFA, the other one's a vertebra with RFA, and then the other one's curved. So we have all of them. Um, the ones of uh, most of us who do it, we pick and choose based on the patient and then not because we think the evidence is better, but mostly so our fellows get trained at home since they have to go out and be the ones like yourselves who are making the choices on which one system makes sense for their practice. Um, so in that sense, we do teach in all three. And my own personal choices, you know, if I believe the height restoration makes a difference and when I see a big height loss, I'll consider using the balloon more than the, the straight vertebroplasty, our augmentation with the curved curette and all that. So it's not as much, I do agree with the, all the data review that Venus talked about, that's kind of the most important thing you have to teach the trainees and everybody that, hey, look at this, you know, there's the talks about the sham and this and that, but if you're going to do it and you feel it helps a patient, what are you going to choose and why and how are you going to justify that to your practice? So um, I guess for us, having them learn how to use all of them makes, or at least the main ones makes a difference uh, in the training aspect of it. But I do agree with Venus, you know, whether or not you think the height restoration makes a difference, there is also some data or studies showing that having the balloon has less chance of cement extravasation. I mean, not many of us see that anymore, but it's a possibility. Right. So if you believe in that, that's one thing to consider. So if I'm in the you know upper thoracic level and it's a big fracture, then uh, you know the balloon makes more sense to me. Or if the height loss is great, the balloon makes more sense to me. It's just right. kind of operator dependent again. And I think the outcomes have been, for at least us, subjectively have been the same. And I think, you know, along those lines, dovetail with that, I think there there comes into play out of the sort of science. There's there's the art of it, you know, and I think that that that's where well, which tool do you pick when? I mean, uh, I think it's you know hard to say. Well, I, I only ever go unipedicular and just put cement or something like that. No, I mean each each case is going to be different. You know, right. there's sort of that um, right. you know kind of technical satisfaction with the result. You know, did did I feel like I got good cement distribution? Is it side to side, top to bottom, ideally? Um, or is it like, okay, I have a focal blob of cement right around where the needle went in and I don't have good, you know, cement distribution to the other side. Again, if I purely look at the, the data, it sort of says, well, it kind of doesn't matter if you have 
a bunch of cement or a little cement. You know, the volume of cement, uh, you know, from the science says it doesn't matter. But, you know, in reality, I think there's that art where you want a satisfactory result. And hopefully, of course, that's going to most importantly translate into a good clinical result. Yeah. And, and equipment wise, you know, I'm actually a big fan of the new curved uh, balloons and needles on the market. And I've gone unilateral you know, on, um, s- you know, l- l- several of my last recent cases and um, both T and L spine. I'd I, I like to know y- y'all's experiences with uh, the, any, any experience with the curved balloons and needles and what you guys, how you guys, if you guys use it much. I have used um, and, and like the new uh, curved needles from, from Stryker, for example, I've used those on a few cases and I've had, you know, very nice cement distribution, um, define, which is now part of merit. You know, they have their, uh, flexible curved osteotome, which is a nice device. Um, especially the newest iteration of it is, um, you know, more, more rigid and, and robust, I think, um, and really can kind of create some nice channels for cement distribution. Um, and so that, I think those adjuncts can allow for, you know, that, you know, hopefully unipedicular approach in most cases. Um, I think in our practice, uh, a lot of the cases we do tend to be unipedicular. Um, and then I think there's even beyond some of those newer adjuncts that can help. I think if we go back to sort of um, kind of some just, you know, good technical sort of skills and abilities as far as getting the needle, um, you know, from a unil- unilateral approach, uh, to the sort of ideally midline and anterior one third, middle one third junction. Um, right. you know, th- that, that takes practice. I mean, I can tell you, yeah. you know, it probably, I would say takes 30 or 40 cases to kind of get that art, um, in place. You know, one of my senior partners, uh, I, honestly, I I'm amazed at, you know, how really accurately she can get the needle placed from a unipedicular approach, you know, multi-levels or whatnot. Um, you know, and I, I, I sort of strive for that. I look at that as like, wow, that's, you know, excellent technical placement of the needle. And I think that's why she rarely uses any of the adjuncts and from a unipedicular approach gets excellent cement distribution. So I think that's another, you know, piece of things that we can, you know, all kind of continue to strive for. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the, I agree with being, you know, that curve and strike with that as well. It, it's given a lot of uh, ease in approaches, especially in the thoracic spine, because it, it gives you a lot more leeway for not having to be such a lateral to medial approach right. uh, with that single needle, you know, particular. So I do like that aspect of it. Um, and, as, and also with the merit uh, or define the curve bronzer or cure out, whatever you want to call it, that gives you a lot of uh, maneuverability in creating your, your channels that you're doing. Um, it's a little rigid, like Vayner said as well. And you also have the Medtronic one, but I think the curved needle from Stryker particularly has helped kind of give you a lot more forgiveness in here. Because the, the, the biggest thing you try to teach the fellows is imagine the pedicle of the clock face and how you're going to really strive to get to that, you know, across the the, the midline. But the curved uh, needle itself on that really helps you with that. So, I mean, whatever tool you're doing, I think, of Vanny said, is the importance of getting to the right spot. And that comes with, uh, as we've all learned, is just practice experience and a lot of fear in the beginning. Yeah, and even craniocaudally, you know, if you have like a superior end plate fracture or inferior end plate fracture, you can direct that needle up or down yep. nicely, you mm-hmm. know, which is what I like about it. Uh, just to get it, like you guys said, just get it in the right spot. And then once you find that fracture line, that cement just kind of goes, you know, the pathway of least resistance. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I agree completely. Yeah. And, and often with those, you know, paralleling fractures, with they, which they very often are. Um, I often will try to get the needle right into that cleft. And, and like you said, the cement's going to go and nicely distribute right across that cleft, you know, that fracture yeah. line. And usually if right. I get that, that, you know, may be enough of a stopping point. I don't necessarily need to have cement go all the way from the top to the bottom. If I can kind of right. get it right across that fracture plane, that may be yeah. enough to get the stabilization and pain relief. And, and often that's what translates clinically. Right, especially with the pain relief. Great, great um, point. That's a great point. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I was curious to know also about your post-op care. Um, you know, are people are you sending people home later that day? I guess it depends on on the setting and the degree of of severity of the fracture and so forth. But uh, you know, and comorbidities and whatnot. But um, when when you can, are you trying to get people home right away? Or are you keeping them overnight? Um, are you having to under you know do like a physical therapy while they're inpatient or wait till they're outpatient. Uh, just walk me through your post-op care. You can go ahead and start, Kumar. Uh, for us, uh, thanks. For us, 
if it's an outpatient procedure and they're not an inpatient, pretty much my standard or our standard uh, post procedures are for about three hours bed rest, immediate ambulation, and then uh, home as fast as humanly possible. Um, yeah. Majority of these patients, you know, with these fractures, they have enough issues going on. The longer they're in our hospital, the bigger chance they're going to stay in the hospital. So if it's an outpatient setting, we li- we literally want them ambulating as soon as possible as long as they're safe to do so. And we stress that in our consultation time, too, when we get the consult either as an inpatient or outpatient. We say we want you up and out as soon as possible. And if you look at the, the data on, you know, every day that a patient is kind of on bed rest, how much morbidity that adds to them, it's kind of astounding. So you got to get them up and moving as soon as possible. So for an outpatient, they're, they're hopefully gone within four hours from uh, our hospital. And then we see them in clinic with uh, new x-rays just as a baseline within a few weeks uh, for everybody. On the inpatient side, I think the physical therapy part's a great uh, alternative to that. As soon as, you know, they're back and they're able to, they should be with some kind of physical therapy while inpatient to get them going. And then I tell patients, you know, outpatient physical therapy is a great um, uh, great recommendation as well. And I refer them to our fracture liaison service, whether inpatient or outpatient. So that's kind of how our practice is. Yeah, I would what say our, our practice is, is pretty similar to Kumar's. Um, we usually do, regardless of, the the patient um, setting, um, two hours of bed rest post-operatively, and then after that two-hour mark, try to get them moving as quickly as possible. And again, as Kumar pointed out, the data is very clear that the longer they're on bed rest, you know, they have, you know, muscle wasting, deterioration, increased DVT risk, et cetera. So all of that morbidity, you know, increases the longer they're in a bed. So the the quicker you get them moving, the better. Um, And that's, again, one of the things, uh, just like what Kumar's group does, we explain to them during the consultation, whether on the outpatient or inpatient side. Um, same thing, I, I definitely agree, um, working with physical therapists, and, and maybe this even relates back to um, one of the earlier points about outreach and who to outreach. That's actually another group I, I failed to uh, mention that we actually you know try to give lectures to and talk to because they're almost always going to get involved in these cases um, on the inpatient side for sure. And so sometimes they may actually be the ones that sort of prompt the discussion or at least a question maybe you guys should you know call ir about this case um to see if they have something to offer and so that's been another resource for us but but nonetheless you know physical therapy is clearly an important you know aspect of things and i think one of the other um sort of changes in our practice after the the vapor trial that came out was um you know trying to you know get to these patients um much quicker than, than, you know, I think the previous, you know, ideas of, well, give them maybe four to six weeks or something of conservative management. Well, I think that trial kind of helped prove to us what we probably know anecdotally is uh, the quicker you can address the fracture and the pain, the better these patients are going to do. So I think that was an, a, an important point from that trial, which we, you know, now try to incorporate. Yeah. So uh, as soon as we can know about a patient, not that we immediately put needles in every patient, you know, we do need to get at least some sense of how are they doing with some conservative management. But I think we're going to be, you know, much more aggressive about trying to help their fracture pain um, quicker rather than giving them weeks and weeks of sort of the uncontrolled pain. Right. Uh, Ever have any issues, ever have any issues with people, you know, with unrealistic expectations, they come out and they still have pain and, you know, they're, you didn't take care of their, all their pain. Um, How do you deal with that kind of patient? I think uh, that's that's the critical component of what I think Benu and I, I was kind of mentioning earlier is that the consultation is really a critical component of what we do in uh, IR that we should be doing everywhere and hopefully everybody's doing is spending time setting the expectations uh, initially, especially with the patient's family as well as the patient. You want to tell them that this is not a guaranteed, like you're going to cartwheel out of here. It's that right. if you have significant pain attributed to this fracture, this will help reduce that pain. Some people walk out feeling great. Some people have residual pain. It's not 100%, but it involves pain control still after that for some patients. And I think as long as you have an honest and realistic conversation with the patient and their family, then they're all very uh, realistic and accept the results as long as everything goes fine. Yeah, I definitely agree that that the consultation and the discussion about the procedure, what's the intent, you know, and what's the goals, you know, has to be, you know, based in reality. You know, I, I tell patients, look, I mean, if I can take every patient from 10 out of 10 to zero out of 10, I mean, that's a grand slam. I mean, but we know that that's not going to be the case for every patient. But, you know, I tell them, well, if, if I can take you from eight or nine or 10 out of 10 pain to three or four, that's still 
very good because a three or four is something we can deal with better. You still may require pain medication, but hopefully less of them. Um, you know, I, I emphasize the physical therapy aspect of things of how that's going to help. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the things, and we see this when we, we see them in follow up, which is usually around the two week mark after the procedure, you know, we kind of talk about that, well, there's, there's this other sort of musculoskeletal aspect, um, after a compression fracture, um, that, you know, that I think they have to be aware of because, you know, the, the biomechanics of the yeah. spine have changed, you know, because of the compression, you know, regardless of how much height restoration you get, you'll never restore it to completely normal height. Uh, you know, and so there's that kyphosis and change in how the muscles are interacting and the ligaments are interacting. And so that's actually, I think, one of the common things that we not only have to, you know, talk about up front, but, you know, that we kind of see on the back end is that now they're adjusting to this new normal. And, you know, we, we, we assure them that, look, this is part of that recovery process. And again, in that consultation, you know, I, I show them the spine model and I show them, and, and I think they're usually pretty good about understanding why that's going to change. So it's not just the pain alone from the fracture, but it's the change in how the remaining bones and muscles are working together, which may have some of this ongoing pain. But I think if you set the expectations realistically at the consultation, they're much more on board with, you know, kind of the progress that they'll make. Yeah, totally agree. And also one other thing I like to add on the consultation expectation part is that I think it's really important. We need to all tell the patients and their families that, you know, your body mechanics have changed. Now you have weak bones kind of globally. We're going to try and help you with this one, but just understand that because of the physics and how things have changed now, you're prone for multiple, you know, more fractures. Uh, next to or separate from what you're treating now. So put part of the expectation and kind of looking ahead, we have to tell them is you're going to feel good and you might try to overexert yourself after that. And you're already at risk to just understand that, you know, this may not be a one and done process with your spine. And that's something I've told, you know, after I started doing this and I realized it's helpful because they do come back and, you know, some patients you've treated over the course of a year with three, four levels at separate times because, right. Their mechanics have changed. Their bones have changed. Even though you send them to get their bone optimized, they're, they have bad bones. So I think that's yeah. another good expectation and let the patient and their family know that you may be seeing them again for other levels. Yeah, I think that's that's a absolutely great point. Um, you know, with, with each patient, I will actually specifically review their particular risk factors. You know, so we'll talk about age or sex or race, smoking if they are, and of course, lots of good reasons to get them to quit smoking, this being, of course, an, another one. Um, and then, right, kind of specifically talk about their, you know, particular fracture. In some of the cases, they may have had prior fractures that were not clinically significant. But then we start to talk about, well, now you've had one or two or three levels fractured. This is the statistical increase that we see on average of how and why you probably will have future fractures. And, and right, you know, a lot of these patients may end up being, uh, to a certain extent, kind of chronic patients of your practice because inevitably they may come back with other levels fractured. But I think, again, setting that, you know, expectation that this is certainly is a possibility. And simply the fact of having had a fracture is now a new independent risk factor, even if they've never had a fracture before. So that, you know, again, adds to their particular patient-specific risk profile. Yeah. Well, hey, fellas, this has been uh, really, really great information, and I think it'd be very helpful for anybody trying to build a uh, retibro or kyphoplasty practice. Anything else that you guys want to add? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I think it's important if you're going to start building this to know the the data, like Vayner was talking about before, know the studies, you know, there's yeah. a lot of skepticism from the medicine side of um, our, our colleagues from reading, you know, the JAM articles of 2009 and such. But it's important to know those and the other trials and the randomized trials and know the limitations of all of them. There's a review article, I think, in neuroradiology this, this past uh, winter, 2017, where they reviewed all those kind of studies and gives you an insight as to the, the you know, the limitations and the biases. So, at least having that, you have to you have to know what they know and know how to counter it with why you think it's beneficial. So I think if you're gonna try and build this up, know those studies at least the the summary zone so you can be educated in your discussions. I think that's yeah, I mean I, I agree with what Kumar said. You know about you know certainly knowing knowing the data, knowing what's out there. Um, you know if they have certain impressions, you know being able to you know educate people about well here's where we stand as of 2018. 
Um, but I think, you know, uh, another thing, and this is maybe a little bit more targeted towards um, trainees, you know, medical students, uh, residents, fellows, um, you know, in, in some places, maybe they're not going to have as direct exposure like in Kumar's program um, to being able to do these types of procedures and see these kind of patients uh, that might fall that, well, maybe this falls under, you know, ortho spine or neurosurgery spine or a very separated neurointerventional division or something like that. Um, so I think trying to get that exposure is important if you don't have access to it. Um, hopefully, most programs do have access uh, for the trainees to, to see these kind of procedures. And then um, I think, um, you know, really kind of getting that broad exposure during your training is important. Uh, I'm glad to hear, you know, programs like Kumar's, you know, are exposing the fellows to all the different modalities, you know, that, that are really out there so that ultimately when they go off to the, you know, practice that they're going to be in, they, they will have had good technical training and hopefully complementing with that, of course, good uh, background knowledge and scientific understanding of, of this important procedure. Cause this is really one of the, probably one of the most gratifying procedures we can do in interventional radiology. And right. especially those grand slam kind of cases, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, the ones that walk out, you know, of their outpatient procedure feeling like a million bucks. I mean, that's, that's really one of the best feelings you can have. So I think it's, it's a very important skill set uh, in the, in the armamentarium for an IR. Anything else uh, you guys want to add before we finish up? No, I just want to say thanks. It's always great talking to Vanu virtually. <laughs> <laughs> no, same here. Great talking with you guys. Again, I think uh, just emphasize this is such a great resource and uh, really happy to participate. And uh, thank you again for the invitation. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, are you guys going to be at SIR? Sure am. Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. All right. Well, looking forward to uh, are you guys going to make it to the Sabine's Twitter party. You got it. <laughs> I'll be heading back before I might, I might have to head back to do some more kyphos. Uh, ah. <laughs> <So we'll do. laughs> All right. Well, um, thanks everyone for listening and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Take care. Thanks everybody. Take care everybody. Have a great.